Okay. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So continuing in the تفسير سورة البقرة, we emphasizing the point that there's a famous hadith that a lot of people misunderstand, and you'll see that there's people have issues with faith uh, based upon their misunderstanding of the hadith. It says that who, whichever home will have Surah Al-Baqarah recited in it, um, then the devil will be uh, averted from this house. Let me just put it to you like this. Imagine there's a home of people who are <coughs> thieves on drugs and alcohol, they do fornication, they don't believe in God, and then somebody puts on a tape of Surat al-Baqarah playing. Do you think that all of a sudden everything will change in their house? It will not. So the superficial understanding um, doesn't hold up to the facts. The understanding that is in line with what the Qur'an teaches about the nature of the Qur'an as well as the nature of Surat al-Baqarah as the Prophet Wasallam has talked about in various things is that this is a book of guidance. Its purpose is to guide. It's meanings carry the ultimate divine truth of the heart, the soul, uh, eternity, purpose, meaning of conscious life. And so we're all in the test of knowing that we're somehow part of that. So the Qur'an is that straight path. Where we came from is taking us directly back. And so the one who would follow the Qur'an in general will be guided. So the idea here is Surah Al-Baqarah carries so many vast teachings about creed, about faith, about patience, about character. The whole anthology of the focus is the history of the Israelites. Those uh, tribes, the 12 tribes of Jacob who were blessed with so many favors that we'll talk about today. And how did they react? What was, you know, the pitfalls? What was the shortcomings? So that we could learn a lesson. Why? Because the finality of the Abrahamic covenant is coming in the Ishmaelite bloodline. And these people don't have too much knowledge about that. So they need to know their cousins, what has happened and how they could learn from that. So some people get the idea Surah Al-Baqarah is a uh, anti-Semitic or something like this. It's not. In the Quran on four or five different occasions, there's general clear statements that from the Israelites is a rightly guided, just nation, patient, following the message of God, historically. Mm -hmm. So the focus on what's wrong with them, which much of their book and their history confirms amongst themselves, is saying, here are some lessons to learn. So we can all agree, good is good, and alhamdulillah, you know, thanks God that we have good. But what we need to uh, build upon is where did people go wrong? And so the Quran actually talks about the flaws of the Muslims, the believers as well. It doesn't mean that all Muslims are no good, and that it's an attack on believers. It means that these are things we should fix. So the concept is, whoever embraces guidance, there should be no sadness and no fear of what's to come. So, as we said, minha jamia. We said, get you down out of it, all together. That's one translation. Basically, God is telling uh, Adam, his wife, Eve, and the devil, all of you are not to be in paradise, in heaven. So get out of there. فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَىٰ فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَىٰيَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ So you will be on this earth in which you will need to search for guidance in yourself, in your surroundings, looking for some way that guidance will come to you. If you look, he says, مِنِّي هُدًا Does he say مِنِّي رُسُلًا? Messengers? That is an aspect of guidance. What are some aspects of guidance other than messengers? Number one, the innate disposition. This is a fancy way of saying fitra in English. 
the innate disposition we all have and inclined to know, to feel good about doing selfless acts of uh, care and concern for others, benevolence. Even though you're actually losing out of this, you feel good to help people in need and to help good things. And you feel bad when someone is harming someone else, even though you're not being harmed. This is telling you this is basic nature. You have this inclination in looking, which is the second aspect of uh, guidance. When you look around at creation in the world, and when you think about your own existence, you conclude that there is a divine, supreme source of intelligent greatness that has brought this all into existence. That is the only rational solution for such a sophisticated, beautiful, organized, created reality around us. So these are all a means of guidance. So what that indicates is that mankind is intended to seek guidance. Now, I'm going to reiterate this point um, because it's fair and it needs to be reiterated because Muslims take religion by culture. They take it because my parents have been Muslim, so therefore that is the religion I'm following. So someone might say, well, we know we're right. So therefore, well, if you ask any Christian born Christian or any uh, Jew born Jew, they think they're right as well. And they believe they have evidences and they've been taught evidences that are convincing. One of the things that make things convincing is cultural acceptance. Like right now, why is everybody thinking the way they think in America or in somewhere else? Because society is going along with that. That is their attitude. That is what they accept as normal, as the standard. Islam is saying, or the Qur'an here is enjoining upon all of humanity, that every single person, because he's talking to who? Bani who? Adam. We haven't entered the Israelite story yet. <laughs> We're starting from the beginning. If you are a human being, you should look for guidance. And you should look for the true proofs of guidance. You should really ponder over guidance and its meanings and where it came from and how, do we, how are we sure about the source of said guidance. How can we be confident in putting our faith into this? How can we be comfortable with our eternity in said system or teachings? So, when some people will ask you, so do you believe that only Muslims go to heaven? The correct answer would be, what does a Muslim, you would respond to them, do you know what a Muslim is? What does that mean? Is it just someone who followed Muhammad? And they would say, yes, of course, this is someone who follows the religion of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa And they would be incorrect. Because, according to what we know, Adam and Eve were Muslim. Jesus, Moses, Abraham, whoever, whichever prophets, whichever people who were following their uh, innate disposition, those are Muslim. The planets, the stars, the, the animals, the plants, all of that is following a system that God gave it. It's submitting its will to what it was programmed to do. So, I think we need to broaden our horizons a bit. Now, the second question would be, should we assume, and this is a really good response to this question, should you assume that the religion you were born into is the correct one by virtue of it being the one you born into it? Does that make it the correct religion? <coughs> then everybody has a correct religion. And they have very different ideas about the nature of God, um, purpose in life, uh, what divine law is, what salvation is, what happens after you die. They have very different ideas. So if being born into it is the criterion, then we have a, a rational fallacy going on here. So now, I'm not saying to be a Muslim is the correct way just because I was born into it. Obviously, that's, for me, that wasn't the case. But for you, you would say, I have objectively researched. Now the question is, have you objectively researched? You have to be honest in what you're saying. So we're talking about opening up through this, this, this uh, ayah, which is talking about the nature of mankind and what they need to be doing with themselves. 
we're, we're basically transcending cultural religion. So a lot of people come and they say, Imam, Imam John, it's amazing. People like you, you converted. I said, no, no, no. It's not people like me. Everyone must convert at some point. By the way, I want to give a little bit of a... I'll give you my personal view. Not that it's the authoritarian view, but I feel that the word convert is correct and revert is not correct. And I'll tell you why. Revert is saying someone was following a specific system, then they left it, and then they came back to it. Was anybody on earth born as a child where non-Muslims, there's no, there's no Prophet Muhammad and things like that. And then he started saying, I believe in the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. Have you ever heard of that? It, doesn't, it will not happen. So the Prophet ﷺ never said, Kullun yuladu ala al-Islam. This is ta'wil. He said, Kullun yuladu ala al-fitra. Everyone is born with the natural innate disposition which is an aspect of guidance but it is not complete guidance. We're all in agreement that that is not sufficient. Why would we have to search if people could just all be liberal and say, you know, I was born, I have an idea about God and I know right and wrong in my own and so therefore that's good. Should we agree that that's guidance or should we look for, as we're being told, for the prophethood, for the messages, for the signs and think about purpose and, and how it relates to each message that we read about and then confirm and ratify true prophethood when we find it. So, you are converting to Islam at some point in your life. Meaning, you had some ideas either from culture, either you were told Islam because your parents said so, or you had some ideas deep down but you were raised in some family that has um, polytheistic or atheistic or some confusing ideologies and then you studied and then you looked at the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you looked into the Holy Quran you looked into his teachings, its miracles, its basis its preservation, its history its way of affecting the people who really followed it and then you said I am now following this ala uh, basiratin I'm now following this on real knowledge this is the thing. So we're all supposed to seek that. So you will find yourself in an awkward situation. You don't have to be aggressive or rude. Well, we are missionaries. We hold a mission. We should not shy away from that. But you don't want to be like, yeah, according to what we know, you will go to hell if you don't follow Islam. That is alienating behavior. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Bashiru wa la tunafiru. Yassiru wa la tu'asiru. Give glad tidings, say something positive and encouraging. Don't say things that alienate people, that separate you, that divide you, that... Be easy, make things easy for people to understand. Don't make things difficult or hard upon them. So you'd say, I think we should all take a deep search about what we believe. And I don't think it's a good idea for me to be Muslim, simply because I was born to be Muslim. And so I'm asking you, have you had the opportunity to study Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam objectively? Have you really done that? Because if you were born and raised in India, December 25th would mean nothing to you. And you would not have this whole nostalgic feeling every time the songs come on. You'd be like, what is this annoying song? I mean, we're just being honest about how, why people think the way they think. They, Religion should be tied into anthropology, psychology, sociology, and we should make a clear assessment of true religion from a clear perspective. So when we come to know the message, here's where the problem comes. Now, people who are not exposed to any real prophethood, or they, the way they were exposed was completely false and wrong, thus invalidating it being met, the message being sent to them. So the prophets came with miracles. The prophets came with an exemplary character. So that was signs apparent to the people around them. But if all you've heard about a religion or a prophet is evil, violent, this and that and the other, you, you don't know the message. And this arrogant attitude of well, they should hear about these beheadings and these crazy 
people and then think, I should study this religion. Why? Because I heard of a few people who did that. Those are anomalies. That is strange from a psychological, scientific perspective. That's strange for somebody to hear about chaos, bloodshed, backwardness, corruption, rigidity, and then say, I think that I should study that. Maybe there's something I need to learn here. Most people would say, that's not my cup of tea. It's just normal. So we carry a big responsibility to try to shine the light. Human sin, they'll only have the right to heaven if they consciously commit to God and follow the revelation seeking divine mercy. That's the only way. We all sin. We're all sinners. But if we find the guidance and we make that the priority in our lives, فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ They should not fear the hellfire. وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And they should not be sad about what they've lost from this world. Whether it be possessions or family or their life. And some people say, what do you mean? We're not supposed to fear Allah. The concept of the fear of God is over, ampl over amplified in most orthodox traditions. If you ask many reformed Jews um, and many former Christians and many Muslims who are no longer following Islam, say what? Man, it was like everybody's going to go to hell. Everything's haram. God wants to throw you in hell. I didn't feel comfortable with that. You, you, I've, I've surveyed. I've found this. This is the wrong idea. We should fear God. He's out to get us. When you fear something, that means it's, it's like if I fear a lion, it's because I think he's going to kill me. But God is not out to get you. What are you really fearing? We've got to learn this one. وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ الْقِيَامَ أَمَامَهُ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ مَسْؤُولِينَ عَنْ أَعْمَالِهِمْ You're fearing that you may die. And what you have done could have counted against you. So, say you are keeping up your daily prayers. Say when you feel sin and you think sin and do sin and say sin, you're like, Astaghfirullah. And then you go do extra good deeds and you make some fasting and you seek some more knowledge and you go back to the scripture and you're thinking of God and you're remembering Him throughout the day. According to what we know from Revelation, if you die in that state, what will happen to you? فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Some people say, La, this guy is tricking you. It's the devil. Because there should be fear and hope. Well, the fear is when the sin hits. When the sin hits, then you're, you're bothered. Because you have sinned. But then right when you go into turning to Him, seeking His forgiveness, working on righteousness, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيَّاتِ ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَى لِلذَّاكِرِينَ This is a beautiful ayah. The good deeds will erase the bad deeds. This is a reminder for someone who will pay attention and remind themselves of this. So that if you did a bad deed, don't be like, oh no, I'm a terrible person, I'm going to go to hell. This is not the idea. The idea is now go hasten and rush to do something right. So we are concerned and fearful of our sins, which leads them, which leads us to repent like Adam and Eve. When God said, did you eat from the tree? Said, yes. Immediately. Oh, our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If you don't forgive us and have mercy on us, we will have lost. They're fearful right now. But then, He's forgiving them. And then He's sending them on earth and He's saying, keep on that system. Stick with it. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Those who disbelieve and deny our signs will be inhabitants of the hellfire in which they shall abide. So these two qualities, God, it's His business. He will quantify who has kafar or kathab. Is it our business? We know in this life to differentiate ourselves from those who have differentiated themselves from us. Ahkam Bani Adam. Somebody says, I'm not Muslim, and they are going to church or whatever, and doing something else, and then they die. No matter how much close friends or the, how much in our family we knew them, 
we're not going to follow a religious tradition of caring for them. We'll leave that up to God. Many Muslims think what this means is for sure they're going to the hellfire. This does not mean that. Because he's the one that knows where is the essence of Iman. Where is it? Where is the essence of faith? It's in the heart. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ sudur. He's the one that knows what's in the hearts. We don't know what's in the hearts. We judge as we see it, and then we deal with each other as that, and we leave it up to Allah to differentiate between the people. What is an ayah? Ayah can be translated as a sign, as a miracle, as a model, something that you, you feel like, oh, I want to follow that sign. Or a verse of the Qur'an. These are called ayat. So said, whoever would deny and reject and disbelieve in his signs, those people will find themselves. Meaning, they came to know it, they understood it, they saw the miracles, they saw the example, they saw the truth, it was clear to them, and then they rejected it for whatever reason. Some scholars added, كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا Like we see in the history of the prophets. Now they work against it. They're working against the message. They're working against it. See, now people are having a hard time. What about someone who's saying, well, I believe in God and all of that, and I appreciate Muhammad as, a, as some prophet, but, you know, I'm having a hard time following all of the tradition and all of that. I don't know their reality. God knows what's in their hearts. It's not my business to judge. If they die, and that's what we knew about them, they're not going to go get buried in the Muslim graveyard. They're not going to get a janazah and things like that. See what I'm saying? Does that mean they're going to hell? No, that means they're not from Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And which is what we know to be, because we have ratified, that's the best place to be for someone who is looking for guidance. When you find it, you see the miracles, you see the evidences, you own it, and then you follow it to the best of your ability. That doesn't make you the owner of God and religion. It doesn't make you the judge. It doesn't make you the criteria for others. It makes you having a criteria for the straight path back to Him as He is guiding you. Some people want to become the guide. They want to become the judge. They want to become the king of the day of judgment. Some people want this when they become religious. And what that does is alienate people from the religion. The Prophet ﷺ was not acting in this way. Now, the vast majority of the scholars of the orthodoxy, they're saying this group is going to the hellfire eternally. They're saying, whoever would find the message and the guidance, they came to recognize it, they saw the proofs and the miracles and the evidence, and they said, I will not follow that. I'm going to stay stubborn, I'm going to follow what fits my desires, what's culturally comfortable to me, and I will not follow this guidance. The vast majority of scholars said, this person has doomed himself. Again, we didn't know what happened before their death and where they were at, we're learning for ourselves. Protect yourself. Now some famous scholars in our history, even going back to some narrations that are attributed to some of the Sahaba, like Abdullah bin Mas'ud and Umar al-Khattab and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Assalamu alaikum. So these... Um, Assalamu alaikum. These scholars have said... Hellfire uh, has to be just because Allah is just. And they talked about some of the ayat in the Quran. Labithina fiha ahqaba. They will spend some time in there. There's an ayah that says, Khalidina fiha madamat is samawatul ard. They will spend time in there as long as the heavens and the earth. So Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya. He has the opinion that hell will be destroyed at some point. There's, he has evidences and so forth. He's, they're also saying that if someone has committed a sin by action, and they did that in a specific point of time, they did that for an amount of time, and then by the decree of God, their life ended before, or that they have not, how could injustice, how could someone be eternally punished for something they did in a specific amount of time? So some scholars, they said like this. At the end of the day, for me, it's not my business. 
can say who goes to hell and how long they're going. It's not my business. We have some very serious warnings about our soul and what could happen to it. We should worry about our soul and protect ourselves from one moment in the hellfire. You see, some, I was talking to one young man. He said, I said, why are you doing these things? And he, I found out about some unfortunate bad thing this guy's doing. He says, you know, inshallah, you know, if you're a believer, you won't go to hell forever. Like he's using this as like some sort of a... I'm like, have you read about hell? One moment in hell is like a whole lifetime of the worst sickness, sadness, disease, uh, affliction, pain. You don't want to go to hell. Not for one moment. So we follow that system to avoid it ourselves and we warn others that it is a reality. And nobody wants to go there for a moment. So... Ya Bani Israel, O oh, Israelites, the Israelites are the twelve tribes of Jacob. Who is the Jacob? Who's Jacob? It's important for us to learn the names of the prophets in English. Why? Because Allah commanded us to. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Hebrew names for these prophets, and you look at the ones mentioned in the Quran, which these prophets, many of them, were here having Hebrew names because they were Hebrews. It's different. Like many Muslims think like Musa was called Musa. Like people are saying Musa. Mushaya. This is the Hebrew. It doesn't fit in the Quranic flow. In the Arabic. Allah Arabized these foreign names. These non-Arab names. Ajami. So that it would flow in the Quran with the style. Same thing should be true. If we're living in a society where people are speaking English and they're saying, yeah, we know about, there's Jesus, there's John, there's Jacob, there's Joseph, there's David, there's Lot, there's Job, there's all these prophets. Some Muslims will say, yeah, but those are invalid. Why? They are not in the Quran. The Quran is um, in Arabic, and the reason being, because the people to whom it was first sent, and the prophet to whom it was sent, was an Arab. It would make no sense for a Hebrew Qur'an to be sent to the people of Mecca and Medina. That would be very strange. And they would not have accepted it. That's why the Qur'an says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولًا إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ I emphasize this a lot because we have a big problem in our community with exclusivist foreign terminologies that make us and our religion seem foreign. When in fact our religion is universal and compatible to all places in the universe, every single atom is governed by what we call our religion. So why would we want to make it like specific to one culture of people? Moses never called upon God Allah. It's not a Hebrew word. You have Elohim, we have it, it's written there. Elohim is the closest you're going to get. This is like similar meaning. In Aramaic, Jesus, ha Jesus had Alaha. There is no Shadda on the Lamb. And there has to be a Fatha on the Hat. Alaha. This is a different word than Allah. If somebody said, um, uh, bi Alaha, every Arab would ask, What the heck are you saying? Right? They will not accept this from you. This is not Arabic. Okay? This is Aramaic. It's a sister tongue. Very close because they're sister tongues. The point is, God is allowing people to say it, however. And every prophet's mission is to define this word. What does it mean to believe in God or Jesus or Moses or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sallam? So these 12 uh, tribes of Jacob. So you have Abraham, his son Isaac, and then his son Jacob. He's the grandson of, you'll hear him called Yaqub. But if you said Yaqub trying to present Islam to your neighbor here, they'll say, what the heck are you talking about? They will not understand. And then when you try to say, well, this is how Allah has said it in the Qur'an, you're just alienating them more. How more foreign can you present yourself? When in fact, religion of Islam is meant to be understood and easily taken in by anybody, no matter where they're at. So, here's an interesting thing. Some... Jews who became Muslim in our history 
they said, in commenting on this in the Qur'an, that Israel means servant or chosen elect of God. The Jews say it means God contends with Jacob or God wrestled Jacob. Astaghfirullah Ali. There's a famous story that the three angels, according to some Orthodox rabbis, God came in the form of a person and wrestled Jacob, and Jacob won. Astaghfirullah. We're not, we're, we're, this is absolutely blasphemy. So they're saying, well, no, it's a metaphor. Okay, fine. I can agree some metaphor, God is teaching lessons, but let's not say God is wrestling anyone. That is, that is, we say, so we say Allahu Akbar. People keep bringing him down. Let's bring him down to something we can deal with and think about and understand. God is not like human beings. So I think when I was studying this that it meant the one who submits. Because when somebody beats you in a wrestling match, you submit to them. The one who has power and authority over you. So I think somebody changed the story about who lost the wrestling match. Because it made This is my feeling. As a Muslim, I, and as a human being, I have a right to decide and believe. I'm not meaning any disrespect to anybody's beliefs. I'm just trying to re reconcile what I know from Scripture, what I know makes sense, because that's one of the reasons and evidences that I have, of many, why I would follow this one as opposed to a different one. It makes sense that way. It's the best way I can make sense of the linguistic difference we have. Because that is the servant of God. The one who knows that he has power over me, and I submit to him. So I'm his servant, I'm his slave. A true slave would submit to the master. Otherwise, it would be a battle between two different levels, and usually one always loses. So as we said, the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina. So the Baqarah is revealed where? In Medina. There was none of Surah Baqarah revealed in Mecca because the stuff is not relevant to these people. So God is now calling out these Jews. Now what does Jew mean? Judah is the fourth son of Jacob. Thank you. I think it's written, it's written up here. Come on guys. People are going to sleep. I'm making it too long. Okay, we'll speed up. Supposedly, the story, they, the story they believe is that Jacob chose his fourth son because the first three were not good believers. And his sixth son is supposedly Joseph. If you go up and you look this up on Sheikh Google, you will find a big debate among Jews and Christians with no Muslims involved. Why come Joseph isn't the one? Oh, well, he decided to be a slave. Why would anybody decide to be a slave? I don't think the story we know is he didn't decide. He was basically taken into slavery. That's what he did. That's not. So there's some interesting differences in things. So uh, then the story is that David came from the lineage of Judah. David became the great king. His son Solomon built the great temple, which was. You know, Mr. Al Aqsa. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is where they're saying, you know, that's obviously God's favor is there. <clears throat> Yehuda, they have it in Hebrew. Hoda'a, which means acknowledgement or submission. And interestingly, that I'm telling you, this is not my, I did not invent this. This is on a, uh, it's called uh, Ch Ch Chavad. It's a website for Jews on, on the internet. And they put it here. That Hoda'a is a Jewish word where Yehuda, you know, Jehud, it means acknowledgement or submission to take on the responsibility. One who acknowledges God's existence and submits to his authority. What do we call that? It's a Muslim. We're not two different religions. We're just two prophets short of the right religion. Same thing, same concept, same need of a law, same concept of repentance, same general concept of God. I mean, pretty much when you study the Jewish understanding of God, it's very similar. 
you know, like, you have interpretations of, of words and meanings and, and people like, like some Muslims say, well, it says God regretted. Well, sometimes if you translate ghadab as God got angry, doesn't that, in English, give a connotation of a, a negative trait, a flawed? Like, why do you get angry? Because something didn't go your way. Things aren't happening according to your plan and expectations, and people aren't functioning the way you want them to. So, you get angry, which then is usually marked by some sort of lack of control or something like this. I think displeasure would be a better translation. Of course, he knows what people are going to do and why they're doing it and the fact that they were going to do it. He's not surprised or bothered in the least bit. But he is displeased that he gave you the guidance and then you would choose otherwise. So displeased is a state of being that is not giving the connotation of a bad response. So it's just a matter of polemics, I think. Words, how you talk about them. The favor, he says, أَنْعَمْتُ alaykum. Uh, remember the favor I gave you. This favor is how he sent all these prophets, all the revelation, miracles, divine support, established great kingdom, Israelite kingdom. They were miraculously victorious over all of these uh, non-Israelite, the Muslim are polytheists. You know. They're, they're the only nation on earth that God gave many prophets Many revelation, many support throughout long thousands of years. That is how they were favored over all other nations. Continuing, the covenant is generally with all of mankind. Believe, embrace scripture, establish divine law. His promise is to continue the favors in this life in eternal bliss as a reward. Now look at this. The next what you see is a verse taken out of the Bible. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. The covenant is, I will bless you if you obey me and you keep my covenant, my commands. They said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Then in Psalms, God says again, this is the Zabur, that's what they call Zabur, Psalms, the Psalms of Solomon, these are the Zabur. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk, walk in His law and forgot His works and His wonders that He had shown them. Kafaru wa kathabu bi'ayatina. Do you see that here? Wallahi, I'm telling you, if you read the Bible, you see musaddiqal lima bayni yadeh. It is very clear. There is actually nothing to fear from reading the Bible. The attitude, by the way, the only texts that seem to prohibit it are weak texts that are not reliable from a chain of transmission. Sanadan. And we have, well, all we have that's authentic is Tahaddathu an ahl kitab la tsuddiquhum wa la tukadhibuhum La haraj wa la haraj Meaning, don't just follow or believe what they said or uh, disbelieve what they said. Read what they have said and say what could be that if it's not conflicting with what we know, it could be. And that's why they had the Israeliyat and all of the tafsirs. Particularly Ibn Kathir went to great lengths to add some of these stories. So if you read some of the Orthodox Jewish books, it seems weird. But it's interesting when you hear the, all of the metaphors. They say, the covenant is simply get circumcised. To show that we believe in God and His oneness, the men are going to cut off the skin from the end. And that's the covenant. That's what we do. Everybody knows we're separate because that's what we do. I'm like, why, why would everybody know that? How, how would everybody know that about you? I think they would know you by your words and your deeds. Inshallah, nobody's knowing about that. <laughs> it's private business. But they're saying like, okay, you have desires, you have to cut back desires, you have, you know, your, your heart, and you have to cut off the veil of the heart. They have all these different metaphors they bring about why it is like that. I think this was just Sunan al-Fitra, and they overboard went with it. You know what I'm saying? I think they just... 
Because Abraham was told to do that. And it was at the same time that he was given the covenant. He said, this is what you should do. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Is there ever written in Jewish history, which is the community we know first to do what? Circumcision. Did the, a female was circumcised? Never. There is absolutely no thing in the history of Judaism called female circumcision. It was never existing. The first places we know about this is in Africa and Yemen. Africa and Yemen, they had it. And the idea was some exaggerated pagan rituals, they had it to control her desires. And I'm thinking, I think the men are usually the one with the problem on the desire angle, controlling that one. Not the women too much. So it's some sort of strange tradition. Somebody might say, yeah, but I heard in Islam, all we know that's authentic. And there's scholars that even question some of the train of transmission of this one. As that the Prophet said, makruma. Did he ever had in, did he ever witness or have anything to do or was taught that by Jibreel? We have no knowledge of this. There's no teaching like that. What it was, it was told to him that the women are doing it. I perceive it was a custom of some people in Medina. He said, warned them, be very careful not to harm or take something that would harm them. Meaning Okay, maybe this is some women, they know this to be beneficial. I don't know, I don't do this. Um, so if you're doing it, make sure you don't harm her. That's why the Jamahir, who, so there's some scholars said, it is not from Islam. There's some scholars said, it is a cultural praiseworthy thing. There's some scholars said recommended, and there's a few scholars said wajib. The broad thing shows, we're not sure about this thing. But what they all agreed upon is what you call uh, um, a, uh, like you're talking about a small amount of something. From what I understood, the outside part, not what most people think. And for me, I go back to the Jews were known for this. It was a divine covenant. It was a big deal. They made a big deal about it. Jews have always celebrated the circumcision. There is no way, because the Jewish community has a strict orthodoxy that has schools of thought and oral transmission, and they're very strict about it. And they've never had any history of a woman being. So I'm sure that this is not part of Islam. This has nothing to do with Islam. And we need to get rid of it because the only places where they do do it, usually they do some sort of harmful thing because of some idea that it has something to do with curbing desires, which is absolutely never mentioned anywhere in the Quran or the Sunnah as such. Because they're getting it from old traditions that were not Muslim. And that, by the way, many African Christians do this, just so you know. So, well, it's not, if you can go to Sudan and you'll see. They're doing it to them. Niger, Nigeria, they do it. Kenya, they've done it. So, I'm going to sit here and tell you, I'm certain there's no room for this in our religion. It is not part of the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. Jews do not talk about the hereafter. Orthodox Jews, they say. But you know what the word for hell is in Hebrew? Gehennam. It's mentioned in the Bible. And the, the Egyptian brothers are like, see, we told you, Gehennam, Shaif. It's Asl, Qadim. Ahd al Qadim, they call it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, they're saying that it's about worldly benefit. If we follow our covenant and we own our identity as we should, as we have pledged, God will bless us in this world. Some Jews say like that. In my humble assessment, God will always give them the means in this world. And He has preferred them. There's no, nowhere it says He stopped preferring them. We have it in the Quran, He has preferred them. We see it 
I don't know why we have a hard time accepting this. They're at the top of everything. They work very hard. They, they have, psychologically, religiously, they have this idea. We are a great superior nation. That's a big test. Just like if you become a wealthy Muslim. If you become a very smart Muslim. What do you do with that? How would you, would you use that for worldly interest and selfish, greedy things? Then it doesn't matter that you had things because you will be dealing with it hereafter. So breaking the covenant for them amounted to stubbornness regarding the divine law. A sense of selfishness and a lack of submission. In the Deuteronomy, this is the Torah, says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me. What does the ayah say? Ufi bi ahdikum wa iyaya farhabun. This is Quran. It says, um, You should fulfill my covenant and you should be fearful of meeting me one day. Then God says in the Old Testament, exactly as we're told, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that I might dwell with them and with their children forever. Meaning, they would come to heaven. The idea that he would come to here doesn't make any sense. God is above and beyond flawed, imperfect entities or world. The idea of the fear of God in Orthodox Judaism is very similar to ours. It means you should be preparing that one day you will die. And even before then, you, will have, you, you can have sins, like for example, the idea of the chosen one in some of the Old Testament scriptures. And the fact that God punished and tortured His chosen Son for the iniquities of man. Christian is going to say, see, this is the Old Testament talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All Jews will say, no. The way we always understood that is, as he said to David, the Israelite king, you are my firstborn son. Meaning you and the nation that you lead. And they're saying that we were kept as a special child of God among the nations. So when we sinned a lot, God has brought upon us the plagues and the genocides and all this. By the way, this isn't me talking. This is Jewish history. This is their own books about why things happened to them. Now, Reformed Jews are going to deny all that. This is opening the door for more holocausts. <clears throat> Orthodox Jews have... I've met Orthodox Jews and they told me, God has been punishing us because we left the law. God is punishing us as a people. We may get wealthy things and all of this, but many bad things are happening to us. And we will see it. <clears throat> Put your faith in what I have revealed to you. Confirming what is with you. The Quran is a confirmation specifically of the scriptures of the Abrahamic covenant. Some people think, I read the Qur'an, I didn't hear anything about China or India or Native America or South America. I didn't hear anything about any of those people or their prophets. So if God doesn't care about them, He never sent them a messenger. Some Muslims have this idea like that. Most Christians and Jews have it like that. God didn't pay attention to them. That's what they're saying. The Qur'an is telling us there are prophets, we didn't tell you the story. Qur'an is going to be like 20 volumes. If he tell you everything happened in the history. And the question is, how is that relevant to you anyways? You are people born in Arabia as grandchildren of Ishma Ismail. As Ishmael. Say Ishmael. And so you have cousins, have done X, Y, and Z. Recently, most recently, a Messiah came. Jesus. Peace be upon him. And they rejected him. You're next. You need to explain to people what you come to conclude. You're here confirming the Abrahamic covenant. So I'm going to tell you all about the stories in your region that are related to this covenant. And it was clearly intended to be the most prominent amongst all prophets, the Abrahamic covenant, because we don't really know too much about, I mean, when you study Native American scriptural proverbs, it's very Islamic. The shamanistic things. When you study Confucianism or Buddhism, you study the principles and what it means to be the righteous person, even Hinduism. 
Only one I can't figure out is Aztecs and Mayas and stuff. They're like sacrificing virgins and taking their heart and eating it and stuff. I don't know what all that's about. I don't, those people clearly went way off into the deep end. That's what the Catholic Church was like. We had to take them over and convert them all. Because look, look what they were doing. You, got, you have to admit, this was a good takeover. That's what they're saying in their history. We had to do it. Look, now the Pope came from there. <laughs> so, um, this Quran is coming to confirm it. This is what this is saying, uh, is saying, this thing, this guy Muhammad, that's coming to you, you know about it. You, you're here for the reason, because you're waiting for him. You are here waiting for this. So the ayah, here we see, 289. It says, when there came to them a book from God, who? The Israelites, the Jews of Medina, confirming what was with them, meaning they have this thing that, the reason why we're here as a big trap, like here's the thing, you have to understand the history of Jews. They were put into exile when the, when the temple was destroyed a second time after Cyrus had blessed them to come back. And then it was destroyed again. God has put punishment on them and sent them into the world scattered. Most of them went to nice beautiful places where there's a lot of money and a beautiful area and things like that. Europe and that area over there. But there is four big tribes. And if you look at who Bani Quraiza, Bani Qainuqa, Bani Nadir, if you study who are these tribes, you will find that they're rabbinical. They're very religious Jews. Because there's not too much economic basis. Who wants to go live in the middle of Arabia? Why would you do that? I mean, if Mecca and Medina was there, wasn't there, would any one of us want to live there? Nobody want to live there. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed it with this Abrahamic covenant. As it was one day green, it will be green again too, by the way. And you see, I think global warming is going to switch all that. In the Ma'al Yusra. Allahu Akbar. It's always there. If you look for it, you'll see the good. It's coming. So, when it came to them, that which they knew was coming. فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا كَفَرُوا بِهِ When that came to them, what they were waiting for. Because they used to say, it says whenever it says, and a four times they prayed for victory over the unbelievers. It was talking about the, the polytheists of Medina. They would say, and when the prophet we're waiting for comes, you will all be our subjugates. We will become the great nation that God has promised. So here he comes. Sallallahu alayhi wa All the evidence. One rabbi said, it's him. They said, what? You crazy. What are you thinking? God would never. An Ishmaelite. One time a Jesuit uh, priest guy came to me in Kuwait. He wasn't a priest. He was a Jesuit student of a Jesuit priest. But he was aspiring to be. Actually, he was a special forces military guy. So he comes to me in Kuwait. And unfortunately, some guy he's with he's convincing him to become, he's convincing some Kuwaiti teenager to become Christian. And his family is like really upset. <laughs> so he comes to me with this guy. Like, I just want to ask you one question. I have one question for you. Like, he's doing the gotcha moment. It's like, we're all going to be converted and see the light. So he says, there's a historical fact that's written in the Bible and has been around for thousands of years. We know it. And that is that God gave the covenant to Isaac and he commanded through a dream, a vision that Abraham would sacrifice Isaac. And the place where he was going to sacrifice him is in Jerusalem. What would you, why would you believe that some guy who claimed that he is the grandson of Ishmael and then he changes the whole story after it's been known for many, many centuries that this is the new story? And I'm the one. And no Jew has ever believed like that. I said, you're a Christian? He said, yeah. I said, let me put it to you in a different way. He said, okay. I said, has a Jew ever believed in the Trinity? No. There's never been any Jew believe in the Trinity. Is God a Trinity? He says, yes. I said, I think we're falling in the same problem here, friend. You're convinced that your ultimate faith is connected to something completely foreign to what we know from the history of Jews. 
Did God not teach them or did they forget or did they not know or what happened? Is it possible that maybe Jews altered historical facts in favor of their own community? Could that have happened? I said, I'm not going to argue with you about this. <laughs> Don't hasten in disbelief. Don't be the first. Don't just say, okay, he's not from us. He's wrong. We disbelieve. What God is saying is, look into this thing. Pay attention. Look into this prophethood. Who is he? What's he saying? Watch him. Before you just openly disbelieve and work against him, give it a chance. Take a look into it. And do not exchange, uh, do not trade the truth based in the signs and message of God for worldly gain. You have been knowing that there's a prophet coming. You've been waiting for centuries actually that this prophet is going to come to you in this land. Here comes a guy saying he's a prophet. And he's saying he knows all kind of stuff about your history that you know there's no way he could know these things. How does he have all these details? I mean, if you look at the huge detail the Prophet ﷺ came with, most average Jews, most, some rabbis would not know this much. Because back then they didn't have like some official, you know, Torah that was codified and, uh, you know, circulated as some official Jewish doctrine. They had some accounts of it and some written scripts and, and papers and, you know, all these things. And then some rabbis would have it, some could read, some could not, and so forth. So what the scholars have said is here, number one, they wanted to maintain autonomy over guidance and be the chosen people. So that's number one. If we were to admit that this guy is the prophet because we see the proof and the, what we've been waiting for and the evidence that he has, if we were to admit this, then we'll just become some followers to him. So we will lose the autonomy, the, the control over the covenant. And number two, they had lots of alliances with uh, people who are enemies of the Prophet Muhammad in Arabia. They have alliances and they have uh, economic interests with them. So God is telling them, do not trade worldly interests for what you know to be what's right. Mm -hmm. So then God says, be mindful of me. Stay obedient. All those biblical verses. God is telling them this. Again in the Quran, what, what has been said in the Torah, Prophet did not read and write Arabic. For sure he never learned Hebrew. For sure no one can communicate to him about Hebrew. And Jews were very separatist. They're not preachers. Jews have never been preachers. They do not preach their message. They believe they're chosen. God has tested and burdened them. Everyone else is bound by their innate disposition and whatever they basically had idea, they're responsible for that and they're not, they don't have to become Jew. Like according to what I know, if somebody comes to a rabbi and says, I want to become Jew, you're supposed to turn him away three times. On the fourth time, you can say, okay, and then you put them through this deep rigorous thing about changing your whole identity and culture and everything and it's a very difficult process. I've actually met some people who went through it and either left or couldn't go through with it and they didn't want to. And I've met rabbis, uh, Orthodox rabbi told me, I don't know why people would want to do that. I wouldn't do that if I wasn't Jew. That's their idea. It's, they're not missionaries. They're not preaching. They're just the chosen ones. And they're supposed to be the examples. And people will learn without having to convert to the whole legal detail of what that means. So they're saying, don't uh, politicize the coming of Muhammad. Don't be like, oh yeah, you know, this is what it is, and so we need power, and this, and the economic, what could possibly happen, and what are the potential uh, implications here to our community. Rather just look into him, look into the evidence, watch for the miracles, how could he know these things, what kind of character he has, what kind of things he says, and then make your judgment on that. But what we know from the history is, one rabbi, Abdul, uh, his name was Hussein ibn Salam, uh, and he, he became Abdullah bin Salam. And he uh, came to the Prophet and he said, I know you're the Prophet. And, you know, I've told the people and they didn't like it. And he said, no, take me to them. The Prophet was all happy. He was like, no, let me we'll talk. He said, no, you don't understand my people. They're very tribal. They're not going to accept anyone outside of their tribe. They're expecting it's going to be one of their children going to become this Prophet. 
No matter if you had, if God said, you know, the guy who looked like this, who has that, and it's everything looking like you, they say, we're going to have a child look like this guy. We're going to have a dark uh, Jewish guy. <laughs> so, that's, I think, it. Any questions? Uh, sorry, I think I went a little bit over on the time. Try to keep it, try to keep it under, finish at 9, inshallah.